Hello, I'm Cheryl Meyer, and this, and I'm otherwise known as Cheryl M. Health Views. And what my goal is, is to inspire you to lead a healthier lives. So when I proposed my podcast, I proposed that we present it in two different segments. The first one is It Feels Good to Feel Good, Future Proof Your Health, where I get to share everything I have learned to return my health back to relative wellness and to live a pain-free life in spite of the fact that I have autoimmune disease. But the second part of my podcast is this episode, and that's Tell Me Your Story The Health Views Is In. My concept was like this is it's all fine and well that you hear me tell my story, but I get a lot of it's all fine and well that it worked for you, but it's not going to work for me. And I wanted you to hear that there are lots of people out there that have made changes in their lifestyle that have supported their health and brought them back to relative wellness. We all have a couple things in common. We all owned our own health. Whatever the doctor was suggesting we did was going on on a parallel path to us making these lifestyle changes where we did things that cleaned up our toxic load. We all pay attention to our body. You'll hear jazz in the background because I want you to listen to the rhythm of your health and I want you to pay attention to what your body is telling you. My body had been trying to tell me that I was going to topple over into toxic load for some time. I just wasn't listening. So if you clean up your lifestyle and if you listen to your body, you have a very good chance not of being deprived in any way, but returning to feeling darn good. And that's what these podcasts are really all about. So thank you for joining me. This is going to be a Tell Me Your Story, The Health Needs Is In episode. And I hope you enjoy it. And I hope that we all inspire you to lead a healthier, happier life. Thank you. Welcome to another edition of Tell Me Your Story, The Health Muses In. And wow, do I have an incredible guest for you today. I know we normally talk health on this show, and this person has a story that you all need to hear because it's still about taking back your power, but she was actually sex trafficked and she has become a huge advocate now after getting away from the people who captured her. She's a huge advocate now to help others who are finding themselves in this situation or to alert parents about the signs and what to look for so that their children don't get caught in this trap. And she is very active and doing some amazing things. So I was really excited. I actually met her some time ago at a retreat that we both went to in Sedona. And I have been trying to connect with her ever since because I want to share her story. It's that important. So let me tell you a little bit about Chong Kim. She's a renowned speaker, author, and filmmaker. Her story was inspired by the film, it actually inspired the film Eden, which is on Amazon Prime. Miss Kim has been educating the public for two decades now in regards to the harms of human trafficking. Through her lived experience, she was actually trafficked by, as I recall, a boyfriend. So I'll let her tell you all of that. She's been educating the public because, and she's now recognized as um, a expert and has been on CNBC, CNN, and other national talk shows. She also has a book called Broken, Broken Silence, which depicts details of her childhood and trafficking experience. You can purchase your copy right through her website, which I will list below this podcast because I want you to get it. She's been given awards for her activism and her heroism as the first Asian American to share her triumph in surviving human trafficking. To learn more from Ms. Kim, you can follow her on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and TikTok. And um, I'll put all that information below this podcast, including 
her website so that you can go there. And she is a huge advocate to get money to the small and medium sized organizations that are really doing powerful work in human trafficking. So please, after hearing her story, go to these sources and support her work because that's really what's we want to save other people from the fate that Chong went through. So Chong, I am so excited to have you here. Thank you so much. It's all yours now. Thank you, Cheryl, for having me. I am so blessed to be here and I am grateful and I'm so glad that we meet. We met at the uh, Soul Retreat and um, one of the things I want to share real quick that a lot of people don't know, I was actually born with congenital syphilis for oh stage God. three. And so being born disabled, I also have what's called osteo osteoarthritis. Basically my bones age faster than my physical age. My doctor actually said that my bones are the same age as an 88 year old woman. So I can feel the humidity hit my joints and things like that. So when I was younger and all the kids would run fast, I couldn't run fast enough. And back then teachers didn't know what to do. <clears throat> the other thing is being disabled, it was considered a cultural taboo in the Korean culture. It was shunned down because it meant something happened to the family to have a disabled child. <clears throat> But um, I want to thank all of you for watching and thank you for tuning in because this is so important to me. And I want people to know that human trafficking, people don't realize this, especially in America, every 40 seconds, a child goes missing and one in every six child <clears throat> falls into human trafficking. And we're not just talking about sex trafficking, but labor trafficking, organ trafficking, and children are also being used as child drug mules, which they will cut open the body, take out the organs, sell the organs, and replace it with arms, small arms, or drugs. And so this is why this is so important. So I'm not going to share everything because I want people to get my book, <laughs> Broken Absolutely. Silence. And um, so I'm just going to touch a little bit and then I'm going to share with you what are so, some signs to look for and how to profile a possible predator. And so I'm gonna start with this. Um, I was actually born in Pyeongtaek, South Korea and I came to Dallas, Texas in 1976. And um, it was just me and my father and um, my mother came later I grew up in an abusive household. My mother grew up in an orphanage in Korea, <clears throat> probably during the time when Japan had left and North Korean, the North Korea came in to enslave the South Koreans. And so my mother didn't have a mother figure. She was an orphan. And by her upbringing of her own abuse and her own um, issues, she passed that down to me because I was the oldest. So basically I was beaten by my mother. Um, I had, I was first raped at the age of three. And so being disabled, having an abusive mother, an alcoholic father, and being raped at the age of three, I became what they call a problem child. What people don't realize, and this is so important, especially when it, we talk about health, because teachers today are still uneducated to identify a child who is having problems at home. Instead, they label them as problem child or bad kids and not identifying the dynamics that's going on in the home. And I had to learn that on my own, you know, early on <clears throat> because my sisters excelled in school. I was making D's and F's. And on top of that, my first rape wasn't my last rape. When I was growing up as a small child, I was also sexually abused by multiple different men, including teachers, principals, clergymen. I grew up in a Catholic home as well. I had Catholic priests and even nuns that sexually abused me. And so when my sisters were doing well in school and I couldn't, I thought something was wrong with me. I also went through what's called spiritual abuse. 
I didn't realize this until I started writing my book. And I was talking to a clergy woman and she said spiritual abuse is when pastors, parents, or even clergymen uses God or faith or even the Bible to control you, to uh, also imprison you, to think that if you don't do what they say or what they do, then you become lightning is going to strike you. Yes. Yes, absolutely. So I want to go on with a little bit about my background. So that way, you know how it manifested into human trafficking. But well, let me just say your resilience is so admirable that you are even here today to tell your story, because I don't think most of the people listening to this have gone through even a small fraction of what you've been through in your life. Thank you. One of the things that became my motivation, as crazy as it may sound, I love Disney movies. I love the underdog always winning. And so I used that as my, um, I don't know how to put it, but I used that as my safe haven. I would escape and imagine myself being you know, Jasmine or being Moana or being the Sleeping Beauty, you know, whoever was the underdog. <clears throat> and so um, I used to sing and I used to uh, climb up on the rooftop and I used to pretend that my real mother was out there and she was going to come and swoop down and rescue me. And because I couldn't fathom how a mother could abuse her own child. It, it wasn't it didn't connect with me. And so I've always been a writer. I've always journaled. I've always written poetry. So that became my first inspiration in becoming an author. But I never thought I would actually publish a book. And so in the Korean tradition, I was told that because I was the oldest, I had to take care of the house. I had to take care of my parents. I had to take it. We lived on a farm. So jokingly, I would always say I'm an Asian redneck because I lived on the farm. We had pigs and chicken and also horses and cows. And so- And you were um, kind of Cinderella growing up. Yes, basically. And growing up in a small, um, white predominantly town, I was the only, me and my family were the only Asian. So we also dealt with a lot of racism. We were called every racial name in the book. They would say, go home, go back home, you know? And I didn't understand what they were talking about. I thought, well, I am home. But one of the things that, um, there was a comedy called Family Matters with Steve Urkel. And he was the comedian, even though he got bullied a lot, but everyone thought he was funny. So I decided to utilize that to change my circumstances and became the class clown. The sad part was the teachers didn't think it was funny, but it kept the kids from bullying me. So I would play dumb just to get a reaction back to them. So that way I would outsmart them basically. But one of the downfalls growing up in a small town and being called ugly and stupid, I was still searching for love, but I didn't know how to find love in a healthy format. And so I would dream of like Cinderella, that my Prince Charming would come in and, you know, galloping in a white horse, you know, in an all white suit. And so I dreamt about those, you know, I was a hopeless romantic. I dreamt about these things. So fast forward to when I was 12, I got tired of my mother beating me. And one of the huge cultural taboos especially in the Asian culture that's very tight-knit, I ran away from home. And it was a huge taboo. Even the Korean community, even though they were small, they shunned me out. They wanted me to go back home, forgive my mom, and pretend everything was okay. But they weren't the only group that had shunned me, even the government system. I remember when I ran away, I had a caseworker, and she saw black and blue bruises all over my body, covered from my neck all the way down to my ankles. And so she said to me, you need to go home, apologize to your mama, and don't come back. 
And I remember I was a sassy little kid. So I looked at her name tag and I said, Susan, um, if you send me home, I'm going to commit suicide. And before I do, I'm going to carve your name on my chest. So that way, when the coroner sees my body, you were the one that killed me. And that's how I got into foster care. So I was in foster care from the age of 12 through 17. By the time I was 17, they said, you're not cute enough. Nobody wants teenagers. So you have to go home. I was still a minor and had no idea how to survive. I didn't want to go home. I went to be actually emancipated. But at that time, I didn't know what emancipation meant. And so, and also being disabled, my father was the type of person who was overprotective of me because I was disabled. I walked with a limp. And even to this day, when I use the handicap placard, I get other people that look at me and says, you don't look handicapped. You're using your moms or you're using your aunts. And I just looked at them and I said, there's all types of disability. And so um, by the time I was 17, I actually decided to join in law enforcement. I wanted to be a cop because I knew what I was going through in my childhood of constant rape, abuse, beatings, and I knew it was wrong. And sadly, there are children that are growing up in domestic violence home and also including sexual abuse that actually finds it normal and they repeat the cycle. And so I am grateful that I had that spiritual intuition to give me that insight that this is not okay. There is something seriously wrong with this. And so by the time I was 17, I joined in law enforcement. I took vocational college. And then by the time, fast forward to 19, I went out to a club, met some friends, and we went out dancing. I met a guy that I thought was my boyfriend and he was wearing a Marine uniform, but he actually bought it from an army surplus store. I want people to understand that. He bought his uniform from an army surplus store. So he was not a legitimate veteran or a Marine. And so to this day, I still educate the military bases about that. I'm actually trying to pass law that anyone who buys uniform have, have to provide an identification. So that way they can track who are buying these uniforms. These are government uniforms. It's scary when you know someone who's in uniform is not who they say they are. And so, but we met and it was like those Disney movies. He knew everything about me. He learned everything about me. He had stalked me prior to approaching me, and I didn't know that at the time. And so he would ask me questions about myself. One of the red flags I didn't realize during that time, he never talked about himself. That's one thing I want people to understand. When you're dating someone, we, we listen to this TikTok, we listen to Snapchat, Instagram, they always post these things of what is a good relationship, what is a bad relationship. And they say, if he doesn't call you, if he doesn't text you, he doesn't like you. Well, guess what? Narcissists can call you and text you. Controlling abusive men can call you and text you. A man who is toxic can call you and text you. So don't look at those TikTok videos and take it for face value. These are behavioral detection that you have to see. You also have to set your own boundaries when you first meet someone. And this guy did not ask for sex on the first time. So you would think, oh, he's a great guy. He wants to get to know me. But let me tell you this. This is also a red flag. Within two weeks, we were already saying, I love you. We were already talking about marriage. We were already talking about children. But for someone like me who has never been through a healthy relationship, and I lived my fantasy off of Disney movies where they meet the first night, they get married and, you know. Live happily ever after. Exactly. And so in real life, it doesn't work that way. And so we have to educate our girls that just because he's calling you, just because he's chasing you, does not always mean it's a good thing. And so we were madly in love. And the next thing I knew, he sold me to an Albanian trafficker. 
And from there, I was sent from Dallas, Texas to a Northern Nevada on an Indian reservation with 20 to 30 girls in each unit. And so when I was there, I was trafficked from 1994 through 1997. So that's about three years right there. It makes me mad when I hear people say it was only that long. Even six months is too long. One Even month one day is, too, is long. too long. Exactly. And it irritates me when people say I'm looking for a survivor who's had more than two years. And it's like, what does it matter? What, how, many, how long she's been trafficked? Does it make you any more of an expert than someone who's been trafficked in one day? It's obviously so, some man who's saying that because that shows a complete lack of understanding of what you absolutely, went through. Absolutely. And if it so, was once, it was too much. Exactly. And so this, because it happened during the 90s and this was going on you know, in Nevada, people didn't see me as a victim of human trafficking. They just call me a prostitute. Even the cops didn't help me. If I had bruises on my body, if I had blood on my face, the cops would just brush me off. So during that time, I had to think, either I'm going to remain a victim and eventually die as a victim, or I have to rank up and be part of the trafficking ring in order to escape. I will share this much. When I first shared my story, there was a woman that came up to me and spit in my face. And she said, how dare you go back and become like them? Well, first of all, I'm not Rambo. I don't have the muscles. We, we watch these action figure movies and we think just like Black Widow, Wonder Woman, these are heroes. But the thing is, real life heroes, it's not that simple to get out. And when you're in a trafficking ring and if you don't know about the Holocaust, if you don't know about the Atlantic slave trade, many of them had to join forces with their captors in order to find freedom. And if people have not been educated on that, then they are missing the education. Because it wasn't like I said, you know what, I want to be a trafficker just like them so I can make money. I still didn't make any money. But because I joined forces with my captors, made me become the top expert through the FBI database, because now I teach FBI how to think like a trafficker so that way they can go after the traffickers that are taking these children. I posted on Facebook a while back and I said, they hunted me, they trained me to hunt your children, and now I'm teaching you how to free them. And I had over 300 likes on that post. So it has come a long ways to the first time I shared my story, which was back in 2003. It was still early on. People were still learning about human trafficking. People were shocked that I became a madam and they were repulsed. Now I have people applauding me because of what I had to go through to rank up to be a madam. Now, when it I- It had to be gut-wrenching to become that. Exactly. It was, it was very, and then the other thing that people don't know about, when I was first trafficked, they injected me in my arm with cocaine, heroin, all types of narcotics. Eventually, I became addicted to them. Of February 22nd of 2021, I celebrated 20 years of being clean from cocaine, crack, meth, heroin, all of the dark stuff. And I am so happy that I did that. And I quit cold Congratulations. turkey. Congratulations. I didn't have to go through rehab or 12 step. 12 step personally did not work for me because one of the first steps that they said, you have to acknowledge that you were powerless. How can you be powerless when you were force fed? So it didn't resonate with me. So what worked with well, me- Well, and it wasn't actually me. their program was not geared towards someone like you. Exactly. Theirs was geared towards someone who chose to get exactly. addicted. That's a di I actually just interviewed somebody who was an empath, but he couldn't handle it. So he got addicted to alcohol. Um, it was really interesting listening to his story and how he got 
out of that and turned his life around. And he's now a spiritual leader. But yeah, no, he he was making choices that were wrong for him. You were not making any choices for yourself. Exactly. Those choices were taken away from me because of traffickers. Right. And so, uh, but one of the things I wanted people to know, what helped me to stay sober, I started learning about DBT and cognitive therapy. That is what saved my life, being mindful, finding activities and hobbies to replace the addiction that were healthy hobbies like writing poetry, painting, arts and crafts, going for walks. These were healthy activities that replaced. The other downfall about the trafficking ordeal that I went through that I want to share with people because I want people to understand the health part about the aftermath of trafficking. It also causes a lot of further disability. In 2011, I was diagnosed with cervical dystonia. And what that is, it's in the same category as Parkinson's disease. And so I have to take Botox so that way I don't have the spasm muscles in my neck because without the Botox, I'd be sitting like this all the time. I'd be- Is it an autoimmune disease? Parkinson's an autoimmune disease. Is this also an autoimmune disease? They did check to see if I had autoimmune. They said that I don't. But okay. they did say that um, they don't know how it started, but they do believe that it was contributed to the beatings and the abuse I went through because it is related to brain traumatic injury because of the amount of abuse. People don't realize that when you slap a kid on the head, guess what? You just added one cell of that trauma. And when you keep hitting that child, remember the old TV that we used to hit all the time? to get the picture right, right, but it eventually will collapse because we kept hitting it. It's the same thing as our brain. We were so focused on the cognitive part with our athletes that we don't do the research on women who have been beaten, with children who have been abused. We don't put that much effort and money into that research that we spend so much time on the NFL because of the head impact but we don't talk about it at home. We don't talk about it with domestic violence. So I want people to know that I've had people say that my voice has changed when I first speak. And so it's part of that dystonia. So it's like someone squeezing your neck while you're trying to talk. And so I have to take Botox every three months. So that way my head's not constantly tilted back all the time. And also that my face is not twitching a lot and my eyes are not blinking constantly. And so that's one of the, uh, the disability and health problems that comes in the aftermath of violence. So when people think about rape and people think about domestic violence, they just think, oh, well, well once she gets better, it'll be e even better after that. No, it, it doesn't. It, well, and, and the psychological trauma has to carry on for a long time. if maybe forever. Um, exactly. You've obviously done a lot of work to become balanced again, but which is commendable because as I said, none of us have gone through anything even remotely like what you went through. But the psychological damage is long reaching and not so easy to get past. Exactly. And I know that uh, I think it was the month of May they were also talking about mental health awareness I have been diagnosed, and I'm not ashamed to say this, but I've been diagnosed with PTSD. I've also been diagnosed with DID, which is dissociative identity disorder. So yes, I do have multiple personalities, but through cognitive therapy, I've learned how to hone all of them together as one because they're still me. But every now and then I'll say that I have reframed the names instead of calling it Jules and Kim and Chong, I'll say Chong is my inner child, the little innocence that I lost. Kim is my inner advocate. She's the part of me that speaks out and educate people. And Jules is my inner warrior because my trafficker named me Jules, but I became a warrior to get out of the trafficking ring to now be the protector and fighter for human trafficking. So I have reframed that for my inner child. And I think we all have that. We don't need to be diagnosed with DID 
we all have that inner child, that inner advocate, and that inner warrior. And sometimes our inner warrior can get us in trouble because sometimes we want to be defiant. We want to eat ice cream when we're not supposed to eat sugar ice cream, you know, things like that. And so... Um, and but I with what you went medication. through, I would bet that it's not unusual that you ended up with multiple personalities. Absolutely. You had to find some way to cope. Absolutely. And that is a way to cope, that you segment different parts of your psyche into different exactly. personalities. Exactly. It's really a stunning so, Yes. And I've also... Um, Give me a moment. I want to show you something. This is really a remarkable story. So I am so happy that she's here and I hope you're listening to all of this. Here we go. I made a scrapbook of my multiple personality. My therapist wanted me to create a cardboard and I made a scrapbook instead. And so this is the book. So this is the Jules part of me. She's the defiant one. She feels misunderstood. Every now and then, I want to feel sexy. I want to feel alluring. I want to turn heads. And so, but other times I feel judged. You know, I'm being called names and labels. And this is the next page. Yep. And I this is them. all part of Jules. And you're also very artistic that you put all this together, obviously. Thank you. One of Jules' iconic um, hero, heroes is Marilyn Monroe. Makes sense. And then the advocate part of me is Kim. The Kim part of me loves the strong woman, loves Mother Teresa, uh, Princess Diana. She loves sheroes that actually go out and help the smaller people. She loves music and poetry. This is the Kim part of me. And one of the things I added in here is that I'm not a stereotypical Asian. I'm trying to be just as American as everyone else. Well, you are just as American as everyone else, whether you're Asian yeah. or not. Exactly. And then this is the Chong part of me, my inner child. I love kittens and puppies. This is the little girl part of me that I lost when I was a little girl. Yeah. And her favorite right, icon. Or... Yes. And her two favorite movies were Annie and all dogs go to heaven because it was talking about an orphan little girl. So as a little girl, I always felt like I was an orphan. And so, but this is my book and I do give classes to survivors of any type of abuse that would like to uh, be embrace their DID or their inner child or inner advocate or inner warrior. So I want to share that. You are the first podcast I've actually shared that scrapbook with. I'm really glad you did because that was all very big a part of your healing. Absolutely. But one of the big things I get asked a lot when I share my story is why do you still smile? For the longest time, I kept saying to myself, why can't I be happy? So I decided to own it. I decided to reach for it and own it. I don't have to ask permission anymore to be happy. I can own it and you can too. I want you to know that if you're at home and you're in pain and you're in misery and you're battling with depression, you're battling with arthritis, you're battling with multiple issues. One of the things that I want to challenge everyone that is watching, say to yourself, even if it sounds silly, I want my happiness. 
I want it now. Happiness is an inside job. There are some chemical things that go on that can create happiness or deprive happiness. We have certain hormones that make us happy. Um, serotonin is our feel good hormone. Dopamine, which I don't know, dopamine is important for Parkinson's. So I don't know if that's part of what you have going on with you. But beyond that, we can create our own happiness. And it starts with gratitude and mindset. And so learning that lesson also had to be incredibly important for your recovery. Absolutely. And you have to have the motivation first. If you don't have the motivation, then everything else will not follow. Because if your drive is not there to want that happiness, you're going to be sulky. You're going to be depressed. But one thing I do agree with one of the NA and AA messages, you have to be sick and tired of being sick and tired. Hey, that's how I got well as I did from autoimmune. I was sick and tired of being, I did not want to hurt. And I had a doctor who had no clue what was wrong with me. And that was not acceptable to me because I knew I hurt. She wanted to give me steroids, but she told me I needed mental therapy. I said, why would I take a drug? If there's nothing wrong with me, I'm going to go find it. And that's where I started my health journey. So, yep. I wish that we would change before we got sick and tired of being sick and tired. But that seems to be the point of no return when we finally are willing to grab a hold of our lives and be proactive to create a different one. Absolutely. You know, and I want people to know that I went through a phase of anger. I went through a phase of bitterness. I hated men for a while. I used to date women, you know, and I was unhappy all the way. And so I had to stop and date myself, get to know myself and go into therapy and say, look, I don't want to be popping pills. I want you to teach me some skills because taking Prozac, or Abilify or all of these other medications is not going to cure or help me with my problem. So teach me how to think cognitively, teach me. And I remember Dr. Zeller, that was his name. He applauded me and he said, thank you for wanting to take control of your own recovery. Right, and And one of the big reasons I do these podcasts is I want people to own their own health and their own lives. We all have more power than we take responsibility for. And so whether it's autoimmune disease or something horrific like what you went through, you have, this is not where your story has to end. You have the power to be proactive and to change your life. And so you fit perfectly into my format for that reason. Absolutely. You know, uh, I get, you know, people that ask me, you know, how about your family? Did you guys reunite? This isn't a Disney movie. When you separate yourself from a toxic family and the family is still toxic, I didn't go back home. I didn't have that hallmark feel of a movie that me and my family reunited and we cried and we were happy to see each other. Nine times out of 10, and I will say this, Nine times out of 10, when kids reunite with their family, they end up going back to the trafficker. Why is that? Because we're not recognizing the toxicity in the dynamic of the family function. Instead, we want this hallmark picture, and we keep saying, you know, they're your family. You should forgive them. You can forgive them, but you don't have to live with it. You don't have to live with that You need to forgive them, not for them. You need to forgive them for you. And so that's important. But that doesn't mean that they are welcome back into your life. Exactly. I had to cut my family off completely so I could heal and I could be stronger. So when I do run into them and I see them again, like holiday functions, reunions, things like that, I will then set healthier boundaries to be able to handle them and be able to know when to leave without feeling like, oh, am I being rude? No, I am being healthy. Right, you have to take care of you first. Absolutely. My um, 
so I want to go back to, because I know people want to know, how did you escape? When I ranked up as madam, I actually, during that time when I was a status of a madam at the time, I found out that I was pregnant and I had to get away. And so I actually crawled through a vent, and I know it sounds crazy, but when you're in that situation where you're being held into one of the casinos in one of the rooms, you will do anything and everything. And one of the things that inspired me, my dad was a huge James Bond fan. And that was when Sean Connery was James Bond. And my dad would watch it, and I would sit there and watch with him. I wasn't into the girly movies. I was more into the action-packed films because I wanted that that hero man to come and rescue me in the the situation that I was in when I was a young little girl. I wanted this handsome, nice man to come and rescue me, to take me out of my misery. And that's why I was so enthralled with action films. I love Die Hard. I love Bruce Willis, you know. I always watch those, and to this day, I still watch them, you know, but one of the things that, you know, when you're stuck in that room, you you start to become an overthinker. You start to think anything and everything that you can think of to find a way to escape, and so I seduced one of the maintenance guys because the maintenance person and the security in the casino needs to be your best friend. Because they're the ones that know all the ins and outs of the building. They know all the loopholes. They know all the, the hallways that nobody else knows, not even the staff knows. Because the security and the maintenance are the ones that have to crawl through those ugly parts and those dark areas. And so, yes, I seduced this guy. I made him think I was in love with him. And so I took advantage of my femininity so that way I can escape because I was pregnant at the time. I didn't want my traffickers to know. My daughter is 24, she doesn't know me. I reached out to her, she hasn't reached out back, but I'm hoping one of these days we can reconnect so I can share my story in full without hear, having her hear bits and gossips and social media version of my story. And so, but that became my escape. But afterwards, I was homeless for several years, I slept on a bench. I slept, and one of the crazy things I remember um, watching The Crow with Brandon Lee. And one of the things that Brandon Lee said, his character, he said, the cemetery is the safest place. When I was homeless and being a single woman in her 20s and very attractive back then, you had men that would pee on you, that would rape you, that would assault you when you were homeless. So when I slept in the cemetery, I actually felt more safe than I did in the alleyway with other homeless people. And so eventually I had people that I didn't know that would offer help to me. They would give me a place to stay. They would feed me. They would drive me around. These are people that were not obligated to me. And so in that sense, I always tell people, I consider myself a spiritual person. I believe that there's angels among us. And so to me, they were my angels. And because I got to see the positive and loving side to them, it helped me to change my mindset about humanity. Because if I had no one to help me and everyone discard me, I would be like Eileen, who is considered one of the serial killers. And one of the things that I felt sorry for her is that no one reached out to her. She was a prostitute, but she was also raped and sodomized and beaten. And when people said, you know, she was a serial killer, you know, she wasn't after the average man. She didn't creep into their home. These were men that were seeking out women to buy and sell and trade. So in my eyes, she is not a predator and she's not a killer. She was a troubled woman that was lost and broken. And even the woman that she loved had also betrayed her and she still loved her anyways. And so when I think about the people that helped me, it curbed my sense of humanity because I used to think humanity was wicked and dark and mean. And, you know, whenever I would ask for help, I was shocked how many people and strangers I didn't know 
that would offer their bed to me, that would offer their home. They didn't know me. They didn't know that I was a drug addict, but I never stole from them. I never took advantage of them. I respected my where my stay was, but I didn't stay too long. And so that gave me that ground of appreciation and respect for the good humankind. And then it made me realize, you know what? I don't have to repeat the cycle. I can fight the cycle. And just to give everyone some insights, not every victim becomes a survivor. Some victim becomes a very monster we are still fighting. Some of the victims end up become predators and they seek out children to buy and sell and have sex with. And I'm the, on the other side fighting it, trying to keep these children safe. And so, but I want to share with you, I do have a nonprofit. It's called Velvet Brick Foundation. And what we do is we raise money and we give that money to smaller organizations, grassroots. It has to be woman led, minority led, survivor led, and also grassroots led. You have to not be like United Way. And you also have to do some type of service. We're not doing public policy. We have enough um, um, policy makers to go out there to change laws. I'm looking for nonprofits that really are going out of the way to rescue a young girl from being trafficked, building a safe home for boys and girls, rescuing women and victims and children from trafficking. If you are doing that type of work, I would love to hear from you because I would love to add you to my database of organizations that we would like to support. Currently, I'm supporting a couple of small nonprofits called Alert Ministries, and they actually go to the juvenile detention center because people don't realize a lot of the kids in the juvenile detention center are not bad kids. A lot of these kids have been trafficked themselves. And because they were caught, they are enrolled as a child prostitute. We need to start changing the laws and not call these children prostitutes. We need to take away that child prostitute label. And then second of all, we're also um, incriminating our girls who had to rank up just like me. If I would have been busted back in the 90s, I would have been tried as a human trafficker, a female human trafficker. I would have been indicted as a sex offender. I would not be given the opportunity that I have now. I have known several survivors who also has a sex offender registry, even though they have never been a predator to a child or anyone else. Just because they were found in the sex industry and was charged, they get charged as a sex offender. That's not fair. We need to change the laws. Right. Um, you, want, the, you want as many people to get out as possible. And exactly. so if they're going to have a productive life, they don't need the label. Exactly. So after I got out, I went to fast forward to 2003. That's when I first heard the terminology human trafficking. I was at the U of M. I was a volunteer as a legal advocate for domestic violence. And I remember my supervisor, she said, today we're going to learn about human trafficking. Well, when I think of traffic, I think the rush hour traffic. So I'm thinking, are these guys throwing women out of their cars? You know, I didn't know what was going on. So we had to go to the U of M, which is the Un University of Minnesota. There was a, um, an auditorium. There were three women from Washington, D.C. They brought a Russian woman, and they said she was being trafficked. When I heard her story, I started crying. And when one of the young college students, she raised her hand during Q&A, and one of the experts, she said, how can I help you? And the college student says, can it happen to an American woman? Because this woman that they brought in was from Russia. And guess what they said? They said, no, it doesn't happen to American women. I stood up and I said, it happened to me. First of all, they dismissed that I'm an American woman because they called immigration officer. So immigration came and they said, you can qualify for a visa. I thought they were talking about a visa credit card. I thought I was getting my reparations. <laughs> and so when they found out that I'm an American, they said, oh, I'm sorry. 
you are not afforded the same benefit. So let me tell you this, in 2003, this is how the law was before domestic minor sex trafficking law came into place. You can have two Caucasian girls that are 13 years old being abused and raped by the same trafficker. But one girl will be from Wales while the other one will be from LA. But because they're both victims, guess how our government treated our victims? The girl from Wales will get a visa, she'll get case management, she'll get reparation, she'll get help. While the other girl from LA, she gets ruled as a child prostitute, she'll get handcuffed, thrown in the juvie, and now she has a record as a prostitute. When I heard that, that's when I became a public speaker because I wanted to change the laws. The more we speak out loud and the more we raise our voices, the more we can change the laws. We don't realize the power we have with our own voice. We don't need a gun. We don't need a machete. We don't need knives. We need our voice. Our voice is the most powerful. Otherwise, if it wasn't that important, the other side wouldn't work so hard to suppress our voice. Always remember that. And so I wanted to also let you know, I want to share some quick tips on how to recognize human trafficking. When you're seeing someone, always follow your gut feeling first. And then two, look at the behavioral detection. When people ask me, what do traffickers look like? I tell them, check everybody. Don't profile them or don't you know, racial profile them or classify them in a business or blue collar. They run in all facets of life. I've seen mothers sell their kids. I've seen clergymen sell their kids. I've seen corporate corporations that bought children. I mean, let's take a look at what happened with Subway when they got Jared to be the spokesperson for Subway. But when they found out he had sex trafficked children, one of the biggest mistakes that Subway did was not offer help to those victims. And that's why they lost a lot of money in their investment. If you are a business owner, and let's say you found out that one of your colleagues or someone that works in your company has infected people, the best thing you can do, and people want to hear, hear you out, is by saying, because he was part of my company, I'm willing to provide free counseling and rehabilitation to victims that he has affected. And so Subway didn't do that. They said, we're no longer with Jared, no more contact. And they sent it in the Twitter. It's like telling a boyfriend, I want to break up with you in a text. It's so informal, so unprofessional, and it's wrong. The other thing that I want people to know, please follow me on all my uh, social media because I cannot express how many videos I share, even on TikTok. I talk about human trafficking. I talk more in detail of how to identify behavioral detections. Look at the behavior. If you're at an airport, and you see a little girl and an adult man, or vice versa, a little boy and an adult woman. If you notice that 10-year-old kid is not saying anything, they're always looking down, and the adult is answering for them, that's a red flag. You can still call the police and say, I want you to do a wellness check on that child. That way it separates the child from the adult regardless of what papers they bring, regardless of what they're saying, their fathers or mothers, it doesn't matter. We even have parents that are selling their kids. So do not let family dynamic stop you from calling the police and following your gut. Just because they're a mom and dad, or just because they're brothers and sisters. We even have incest going on in families. So if you see a father kissing his daughter inappropriately, Feel free to call the police and say, this doesn't look right. There is something unhealthy. If you follow me on all my social media, I will also give tidbits. I also have a YouTube channel called Let's Talk With Chong. I talk about uh, rideshare safety, what to do, how to be safe, and things like that. When you have your cell phone and you're taking Uber or Lyft, because they are actually, I don't consider them 
qualified taxis because a real taxi driver has to go through thumbprint, has to go through background checks and everything. When I applied for Lyft and Uber, they did not ask me for my background. I want to let you all know that. So when you get into a ride share, take a picture because they'll show their picture also before you get in. You also want to take a screenshot, send it to three of your friends. That way his license plate is on there and they know the license plate. His phone number will be on there and they'll know his phone number or his, her number. And then you stay on the phone with that person until you get to your destination. So one of the hardest things that I always tell people, you want to make sure you have friends that are actually going to be there for you, not say they're going to be there for you. So I would challenge you to do a test run. When you take ride share, send the screenshot to three of your friends that you think will be there for you and see which one responds. That's how you'll know who your real friends are because we also need to advocate ourselves who our true friends are. If we don't have any friends, contact an advocate, contact me. Feel free to contact me. I'd be happy to be that friend to take that screenshot and to call someone on your behalf. And so I want to let you all know that after I had shared my story and I have also changed the laws to where now we have a law called the Safe Harbor Law it recognizes domestic minor sex trafficking. It still does not recognize adult domestic trafficking. So we're still working on the laws to, to include people like me, because I was 19 when I was sold, not 16. But even at 19, I was sold as a 13-year-old Japanese girl, even though I was 19. And so college girls get trafficked all the time. And they're not even part of that bill. So we need to still change laws. So I want to let you know that um, you can buy my book. If you want to learn more, you can buy my book on my website. Cheryl will have my website as well as how to follow me on all uh, formats of social media. It's at I am Chong Kim. You can follow me on TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. I'm on all four of those. And so, Cheryl, do you have anything you want to ask Yeah, me? you had told me you were working with the FBI and that you're working on a possible Netflix show. Is it premature to tell them about anything about that? Um, I am actually working on a scripted TV series. Um, we got distribution from Sony, so it could possibly be on HBO Go, but it hasn't been produced yet. We're waiting for funding. So if anyone is interested in investing in my TV series, we are looking for investors and you would be known as an executive producer for the investment on the TV series. And you're also giving back because about 15 to 20% of the proceeds that we make for the series will also be given into my foundation that we will give to small nonprofits. If you want to donate, I do um, do rescues. I have three survivors that I'm currently helping that have escaped trafficking. One of them is going through terminal cancer. Um, two others have small little babies. Um, you can send me a cash app, um, Zelle. Um, I can share with you all, or you can donate on my website. Um, or if you can buy books, that will go towards the uh, rescue. I have done so many rescues, that's why I have to have a car to help with the rescue. I've even picked up a young girl all the way from San Diego and I flew her and I flew out there and I flew with her to make sure she wasn't by herself all the way to Dallas, Texas from San Diego to keep her away from her trafficker. So I've done a lot of rescues. I've done a lot of consulting with the FBI. I help with the case. I teach them how to think like a trafficker. I teach them code words things that people, that these traffickers say. And so because of my experience of working with the FBI, that's what the TV series is called Every 40 Seconds. And it's actually about me teaching the FBI how to think like a trafficker. So it's like a crime show. So all you people that love criminal minds, law and order, you'll be in for a treat because this will be the first 
scripted TV series that's a crime show that's about human trafficking. And it's, do you have any statistics on how prevalent human trafficking is in the United States? I know it's much bigger than I had any understanding of. I don't have the exact statistics. I do know that United States is ranked number two globally. Texas is ranked number two nationwide. California is ranked number one. And, <laughs> um, and Florida is ranked number three. And so this is very important. But like I said, every 40 seconds, that's about 2,100 children that are missing per day. That's a lot. And we remember when we used to watch them through milk cartons and things like that. So when you see me post about a missing girl, I urge you to share regardless of what race she is. One of the downfalls that what I'm starting to notice is that when we share anything about ethnic girls, they're not being shared as much. And we need to share for all children because they all matter. And we need to give them the same amount of attention that we give to any other child that is missing. Like John Binet, when she went missing, or when she was found dead. Elizabeth Smart, when she went missing. You know, we need to give the same attention for these other ethnic girls because every child matters. And it's important that we share their photos and their stories so that way we can find them quickly. So that way they are not in the harm's way. I had someone say, well, they ran away, so they chose. It doesn't matter whether they ran away. Traffickers love runaways. That's what they look for. They look for the runaways. And we need to start educating people that even if they're runaways, we still need to be alert and ask for help. To find even them. as runaways, they are not throwaway children. Exactly. Exactly. And so... I want to um, thank you again, Cheryl, for having me here. Uh, thank you so much. You, you know, your resiliency is overwhelming to me because you came up against odds that aren't beat by very many people. And you were so determined to have a real life and to, and to live on the street as long as you did and to come out the other end and be the person you are and to be helping so many other people. It's really commendable, Chong. And I thank you, thank you. for sharing your story with the people who watch me. And this thank is also you. in 80 countries. So hopefully you'll get some response from this. At least we will have raised people's awareness that yes. things are not always the way they appear to be. Exactly. And if you want me to come and speak at your university, I speak everywhere to schools, high schools, colleges, community places, police departments, hospitals, you know, please look me up on my website, book me to come and speak. I will bring my books and, you know, I can educate you, um, you know, because of COVID, I haven't had very many speaking days because we, even if we're doing virtual, you can donate. You know, I can't stress that enough because we've got so many survivors that are over the age of 18 that have nowhere to go, but they also have children by the traffickers and they need to be cared for as well. So. Okay, well, thank you so much for sharing your story. Um, thank you. I'm sure that it's been part of your healing process to get out there and share your whole story, yes. but it's also, I'm sure it's very painful sometimes to share. That yes. brings it brings back the experience. So it's important. And thank you. I am so happy that you joined me here today. So thank you very much. Thank you for having me. I'm honored to be here. I'm honored to have you. <laughs>